the 18th of January, going on the morning walk again. It's about 8 o'clock right now. Boy, you know, I'm just amazed by nature. You know, God has created processes and set them in place and then kind of just watches, you might say, to see what develops out of them. There's something about evolution that the creationists just don't quite understand that that's part of God's processes also. But the word influence is what jumps out at me. He asks the old patriarch Job if he understood the sweet influences of Pleiades, which is a constellation in the sky. But I see God's influences everywhere. There's something like guiding what happens in nature. It's totally random, but just like I have this, well, this old stick here, this walking stick, I can influence things. I can let them go along a certain ways and then just kind of, if they're going all right, I just leave them alone. But if I want something done, I would just influence it a little bit and the process will go the way I want it. Look at this vine, for example, hanging here. What influenced that thing? What instructions guided that? That it, one vine wraps around another, grows on up to an intersection, and then one goes on up to the to the top one way, and the other vine splits and go. I don't. I just see when I look at the natural world, I'm just amazed. It is so wonderful to see and acknowledge the things around us like this the apostle paul said if we wanted to learn anything about god if we wanted to understand anything about god look at nature look at the things he says that have been made and you can understand the mindset of the maker nature is just it's too wonderful to fully grasp, I think. It's January the 18th, about 15 after eight in the morning. You can see the leaves on the bank here alongside the road and last year's moss. One little area you can see the promise of spring coming a couple months from now but one little area with new growth on it even in January generation after generation I noticed the root system on this old tree here maple tree whenever I walk up the road then that looks like a sliding board or a sliding, uh, some kind of a slide. It's, I mean, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying it just looks like it. Where some little things could have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, maybe they are, if we could see them. Sliding down that old bank under that maple tree. Nature is uh, artistic and poetic. Well, better get to the top so I can turn. Look at that paper wasp nest that was put up there. And that old tree sometime last summer. When I look at nature, everywhere I look, I gotta pick up my stick. Everywhere I look, I see intelligence, design, information, like that paper wasp nest. Up off of the ground to keep away from would-be predators. 
light as a feather on a limb, yet impervious to the weather. I see intelligence everywhere. I mean, it's design concepts. And what do we call the designer? It's intelligent design. It's not random, haphazard. It is intelligent. And it's everywhere. It's like self-evident that something is guiding things. <coughs> Look at a vine. <laughs> a vine has really no, no main trunk or no stalk. In order to reach up with its leaves to unfold into the light and carry on the photosynthesis so that the thing can get process the nutrients out of the ground, it gets a hold of something that does have a trunk, a tree, climbs all the way to the top. It takes years to do it. And underneath all the trees, the mycelium network set up, where when it wants to expand, it sends fruiting bodies up to the surface. We call them fungi or Mushrooms, pick them and eat them. They can't carry on photosynthesis. They contain no chlorophyll. It's a symbiotic relationship that all of the trees are aware of. And yeah, trees are aware. I don't know how far you would go to say if they are sentient. Some people think they are. A lot of the information that I've read and observed on the internet by different laboratories and different people around the world have some surprising results that I think most of us aren't aware of. Um, there was one example that jumps out where a certain woman, a lab assistant, would come into the lab and break um, like a little limb, part of, of a plant off. And it got to the point where they brought in some uh, sound equipment to uh, get the different frequencies of sounds that was present in a room that was beyond the uh, audible range of, of, you know, the workers. And they heard that uh, when the woman trimmed that plant and broke some of the parts of the stem off, it actually screamed or carried on and it got to the point where the plants would recognize when she came into the lab and they would make that sound again inaudible to human ears and let, but they would catch it on uh, equipment and the plants would scream every time she came in a room whether she did anything or not they wreck how could they recognize can they see and they seemed to also have a memory. They remembered who she was. They saw her come in. It's amazing. I found this with uh, Japanese researchers, English, British researchers, American researchers. It doesn't matter. It's, the results are the same. Plants seem to be sentient. And they move on such a slow time scale. We don't even know they're moving. There are some plants that don't even have a root system. That they just, they can move up a plant, they get carried through the air, they can attach to something and move along it, live off of it. it it's just, nature is utterly amazing. Now you know there's mycelium in those trees down there. I'm looking at the trees on the other side. Look at that old tire land there. That's what man contributes to nature. People ought to be ashamed of themselves, throwing out 
litter along the road and such. I think uh, it's just beautiful. Look how the the raindrops hang on on the limbs and the branches. That's just beautiful. There was uh, one account that I was uh, watching on a video, actually, where these uh, large animals, I, I for, forget what they were called. Uh, oh, darn it, elands or something like that. There's a, a, a big deer, about the size of an elk, I guess, in Africa. And, uh-oh, uh comes some geese. <laughs> anyway, um, they were grazing on these trees, a certain tree. And, you know, you and I, we think of talking and communicating with each other through sound. But communication is communication. It's just passing information from one place to another. And some of the life forms around us do it in a chemical fashion. Now, these trees were... Uh, becoming threatened by being over browsed with these uh, four-footed animals these uh, great big deer like thing and so they started giving off this uh, it's an alert a chemical alert and all the trees in the region around there knew what was happening that these trees down on one side were being grazed and browsed to the point of uh, it was becoming dangerous and threatening that for them to continue living so when they gave off this chemical message trees around for miles started putting off uh, actually it was a toxic chemical that wasn't in the leaves and the twigs before but was after the trees responded to this over browsing and the local uh, game commission people land managers uh, noticed that uh, there was whole herds of these animals dying dead they would drive out and, look and just see them dead and couldn't figure out what what was going on no shots nobody shot them uh, every the water was good they took them to the laboratory, did autopsies on them, and found traces of this poison in their system. Now, these deer, as a way of life, normally... Now, there goes a great blue heron up there. It's cruising over top of the hill, going to land at our pond. But... Um... The game commission people and the wildlife biologists knew that uh, these deer uh, browsed off of these particular type of trees and uh, they had no problem with it. The trees didn't have a problem, neither did the animals. For years, just a way of life. But when the herd increased because the wildlife biologists made uh, everything optimized and kind of ideal for population and protection. They increased in overabundance to the point where they were actually threatening the trees. So for the first time that the, they were aware of, when that uh, the carrying capacity of the land wasn't uh, sufficient to stand... Uh, the pressure that these animals increased in great number then were putting upon the carrying capacity for the first time. Those trees started putting off this toxic chemical and it killed off so many of the, you know, they, they could have harvested some of them by hunting instead of letting the trees kill them. But, uh, you know, life is a learning process. Everybody's going through a learning curve. Anyway, uh, the trees killed the deer, so the deer wouldn't kill them. Uh, <laughs> even water has memory. 
it retains certain information about the areas that it flows through. Uh, type that into your browser and Google it sometime. It's amazing, this world that we live in. And it's like most of us go through life with blindfolders on. Yeah. God basically takes hands off and lets the processes work that he sat in place. Look at that poor little deer down there in the creek. I noticed it the other day. If you could see it, water running over it. Death is part of the processes here. Well, one process that just befuddles me is metamorphosis. Now you take the well-known monarch butterfly as an example, but there's a lot of butterflies that do this. It starts out its life as a worm, a worm. No rigid parts to it, except maybe a couple like, well, a few like the hickory horn devil. They have these uh, kind of hard, well, they look like horns on his head. But anyway, I want to get back to the, the monarch. It starts out as a, this thing is so delicate. I mean, a, a child could destroy a, a butter, butterfly, but the, they are so delicate. Yet they fly around in 35, 40 mile an hour winds. Every year they fly across to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico from northern United States and even Canada. They fly, picture that, flying 1,500, 2,000 miles down to the Gulf of Mexico and then just keep going right out over the Gulf of Mexico till you get to Central America or parts of North America down there in Mexico. Anyway, they start out as a worm. They cannot reproduce. The only thing they can do as a worm is eat. And they do, like most worms. They just crawl around go out on the limbs, plants, and eat. Then something triggers an amazing process. They spin a chrysalis. They spin a, which is amazing in itself. They attach this thing that they weave to a limb on a plant, a cocoon, they go in, they, they wrap it around them, and then here's what's amazing. You know, we're all made out of stuff on this planet. Stuff that takes up space and has weight matter. Well, this worm, its matter kind of basically dissolves. <laughs> If you would open up that cocoon halfway through the process, you would find just an old blurry mess in there. There's uh, one report I read on it by a biologist was explaining that uh, even cell combinations are all broken down it's almost like it goes back into like an atom bank or a compound bank where things are broken down completely. There's just a slime left and nothing of the worm remains. It, nothing of the structure of the worm is kept, but it's all broken down to a goo. And then this process, thank, thank God for it, it must be present when that worm is nothing but goo. The, the process is there. Intelligence. And what does it do? It takes all of, the, all of the matter that had built a worm 
before, rearranges it, puts it back together, different compounds, completely different than before, come in, into being because of using this mess to build something different this time. And when this, finally, this process, information of rearranging things, when it's finally completed, this, what is it? Is it a being? It's there. It, it's in the process of be. <laughs> it opens up what's left of that cocoon. And now, it sticks these long legs that have joints in them out through the material of the cocoon, rips a hole bigger, climbs out itself, and unfolds these massive wings where it was a worm before and crawled around at the mercy of gravity and predatory birds and everything else. Now it's got wings. And before, before fall, it's going to fly to a place it has never been before. That is about 3,000 miles away. And it's going to go exactly there. Information. Information. Yes, there's matter in this reality that we have. Now look down there. See, when I hunt ginseng, I always look for beech trees because beech and oak, that's the kind of woods that has the chemistry to grow ginseng. But in the winter times when you can really tell beech trees, let me turn this camera around a second. Hold on. See those light colored leaves down there? Those are beech. If you want to find a forest that's got beech in it, don't go in the summertime. It's too hard to tell. You want to take a nice ride in the country in the winter or the fall? Get yourself some information together for ginseng hunting next year? Well, you want to look for some beech trees. This is the easiest way to do it. You can spot them from half a mile away. And you can tell the population of the beech in there and the size of them. When all the trees drop their leaves, the beech retain theirs. Beech trees hold their leaves even longer than oak. Now everybody knows oak holds their leaves. Anyway, it is so beautiful this world that we are part of and the metamorphosis the metamorphosis of a monarch butterfly is just one example there are so many things like the ant lion or a newt certain salamanders uh, well, it's a shame that religion has ruined the Bible, the concept of God and spirituality. It really is. You know, people have been indoctrinated into religious concepts that, I mean, really, that they don't even, they wouldn't recognize God if he was right in front of them. All of the ceremonies and the rituals, all of the antics that the televangelists do, to me, they're actually nauseating. They take a, a small word 
a two-syllable word like Jesus. <laughs> and you'll hear them stretch it into like nine syllables. <laughs> They'll say, Glory to Jesus. <laughs> oh, that just tears me up. And then they say, Say amen, somebody. <clears throat> no wonder the scientific world doesn't get a chance to, to use this great textbook called the Bible. Actually, a book of books. They wouldn't know, they wouldn't know God if he came to their door. I think Bigfoot is the ogre that is talked about in a lot of a lot of myths and tales. Every nation, every people, race and tribe on this planet have documented histories, uh, written histories and oral histories of having run into other things on this planet that live with us that you can't see just whenever you want to. Do you ever notice that you can't fly but a bird can? Yeah, you understand the physics behind that. We got to put everything in a box of physics. Listen, there's some things that you can't understand. You just can't. You know, one thing that amazes me Look up there at them clouds. You see them clouds? Now let me ask you something. What, what is heavier? Dry air or wet air? I would like to know how those clouds can float. That is water vapor. And up where they are, it's really cold. If it was really warm up there, the air could hold more water and the clouds would go away. They would just evaporate into the air. But it's cold and wet. Why don't they fall? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. I have seen things in the woods that are in the woods. If you don't go out there in the woods, you're not going to see them. You're just going to have to hear people tell you about them. And that is so easy to dismiss. But I'm telling you, when you go in, I've, I've been in the woods for over 50 years, hunting ginseng, hunting squirrels, walking. There is a presence in the woods. I've never felt alone in the woods. Never. I've often told my wife that. I said, Viv, when I go for a walk, I don't care what woods it is. There's something out there. And over those years, I have seen things. I've seen things move. move. And I have approached it, and as I get up there, it's gone. But there's something left in its place. In other words, I've seen stumps that seem a little blurry and they move, a bottom of a tree. And when I walk to it, it's what it is, a bottom of a tree or a stump. And it never dawns, or, or I hear things. And a, a close too, but never get to see them. Now, these things, I believe, can come and go in and out of the present reality that I'm in into what I call their default reality, the one they come from. You know, people who believe in the Bible and they go to these Wednesday prayer meetings. I, I don't care. I ain't got anything against them. They just, you know... They do the truth a great disservice by preaching like that. Things that turn, turn people off. But they don't, there's people that don't believe in UFOs. 
or extraterrestrials or aliens but Jesus Christ looked at a group of people one day they wouldn't listen to him they just couldn't hear him he said to them <laughs> this he said you are from the earth from this world I am NOT of this world now that is about the best definition of an extraterrestrial as I can think of extra means outside of or beyond and terrestrial is referring to terra firma here the dirt the earth so anything that's not from the earth or didn't originate here is extra outside of the terrain extraterrestrial that's what Christ said he was he said I am not of this earth now how many people call go to church you know religiously go through their ceremonies and rituals how many of them believe in extraterrestrials well <laughs> they better believe in one <laughs> anyway back home so thanks for going with me on the walk this morning I'm gonna go in and make breakfast now catch you later bye Thank mm -hmm. you.